All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this week's session of Introduction to the 12-Step Process. Woo! All right, we're going to start off like we always do. God, take away everything I think I know about this book, about this process, and about you, God, so that I can have an experience with you. Uh, before I get started, I just want to address a couple things. A friend of mine reached out to me and said that she had met some newcomers and uh, that she passed on my YouTube channel to them so they could go through the book. And basically my response to her was, I didn't make it for that reason, you know? Um, basically, it's for whoever's watching this to be able to take other people through the book. So if a newcomer comes in your life or someone who hasn't been through the book or someone who's interested in going through the book, yeah, don't show them this video. Like, you do it. You take them through it because this is about you connecting to your own personal relationship with your own personal higher power. Um, this is about you working the program, you know? So don't rob yourself of that experience. And uh, I also want to let you guys know that this is really normal. Um, it's normal to feel insecure. It's normal to feel like you don't know enough. It's normal to feel like you can't carry the message um, this way properly, like you're not going to remember everything. And I just want to let you know that it's all good. Like when I first got started and my sponsor first took me through the book like this, A, um, he didn't even pass on all the information I'm passing on to you because that, you know, he didn't have a lot of that backstory stuff. But B, I didn't pass it on perfectly in the beginning either. Um, I feel bad actually for the first guys that I worked with. There was four of them. I think it was Chris, Pat, Ryan, and another one. And, you know, they got the best that I could do at that time. You know, and over the years and over working with many, 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 many people because I dedicate my life to it, I got better at it, you know. And I wanted to become better at it, so I researched other information. Of course, I listened to the Joe and Charlie tapes. I read a book called Not God. I, you know, read Lois's autobiographical Ebbies too, you know. So I definitely took in a lot of supplementary literature to make this book more exciting than it is if you're just reading it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, in the beginning, those guys didn't get that. They just got underlining and highlighting and they got the best discussion that I could give at that time. You know, so it was through practice that it got better. So if you don't feel like you can carry this message exactly how I'm doing it, it's all good. It's not about that. One of the things that my sponsor told me was that it's about my process with it. It's about how I do it and how I deliver it. You know, and everyone develops their own style. Everyone has their own process and it's all perfect. It's all good. So I encourage everyone to, you know, just, just do it. That's, that's the key. Um, so yeah, where were we? I think we're in the doctor's opinion, right? Let's get there. Okay, cool. So I think the last thing that we talked about was here. It says, these men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. So here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and shift the book up. So basically what we had talked about was that it's really important to identify the phenomenon of craving if we want to identify as drug addicts or alcoholics. Because without that, it's really impossible for us to identify because that's really what separates us from other people, right? And we're using this doctor's example as a way to do so, which is how many times in your life have you drank or used beyond what you intended to do? How many times in your life have you not shown up for something that you wanted to show up for because you drank or used, you know, and you went too hard and you missed it or you hung over for it or you weren't 100% at it or whatever. So that would be a good way to acknowledge that. So let's move on. It says, there are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Okay, so what is the supreme sacrifice? The supreme sacrifice is death, okay? Uh, the biggest sacrifice that we can give is our life. And if you've been sober or clean long enough, 
Uh, I'm sure that you've had the experience of people that you know or loved or worked with um, die because it happens. And that's a problem with the physical allergy. And that's a problem with basically trying to control or manage your drinking using when you have this physical allergy is that unfortunately it can kill you. It says the classifications of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. So now they're going to try to break down or the doctor is going to try to break down the five different general classifications of an alcoholic, right? So number one, and we're going to write number one here. It says, there are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful. They make many resolutions, but never a decision. So are you a psychopath? I'm a psychopath, right? There was many times where I was emotionally unstable. There was many times where I try to stop using this or try to change different drugs to make my life more manageable. There was times that I was sorry. There was times that I made promises to people and I never really followed through with any of it. So if you can relate to any of that, then congratulations. You're in the psychopath train too. Woo! Okay, cool. Number two, right? Number two, there is a type of man who is unwilling to admit he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or environment. I was one of these too. I thought that if I fled the country from America to go live in another country, things would be different. I thought if, if I changed this relationship and went to that relationship, it would be different. I thought that I, you know, stop selling drugs and try to do normal job people stuff, that things would be different. But it wasn't. I also tried to you know, stop smoking meth. I'm just going to smoke weed. It's going to be okay. Or I'm just going to drink a little, or I'm just going to drink beer. It's okay. You know, these are the things that I tried and did not work. Okay. If you can relate to that. Cool. Number three, there is a type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. So, this didn't happen to me, obviously, until I was sober, right? Because before I got sober, there really was no period of time where I was without drug or drinking. And what happened for me, and I think I shared about this already, was at 10 years sober, I look back and, you know, how, what it was like for me to get sober. I was 22 when I got sober, and I thought to myself, wow, I'm looking at a lot of 22-year-olds these days, and what they do is they party. That's what 22 year olds do. And then I looked at how easy it was for me to give up drinking and using. Like I wasn't one of those people that, you know, in their first year of sobriety was like craving smoking meth. Like it was my thing. Granted, I was, you know, in jail for the first six months of it and also in a structured sober living home for the rest of that time. So I was really removed from my drinking and using environment. Uh, and the other thing was, you know, I went through some trauma, I guess. My mother and I tried to kill ourselves together when I was, you know, 17 in high school. So all these things were things that my brain had rationalized as like, okay, maybe it was just a phase. It wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that hard for me to give up and everybody else was doing it. So it's been 10 years. Maybe I can control it, right? Now, granted, because I had already started working this book process, that was just a thought that I laughed at and it wasn't something that I gave into and obsessed on and turned into a reality um, because I was constantly taking people through the book and battling the mental obsession, basically battling the ability to believe a lie through working with people, you know. But if I had not done that work, I've seen a lot of people with 10, 20, 25 years of sobriety basically go out over stuff like that. Number four. There is a manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Could we be any more vague, big book? Um, basically, I think they're talking about manic depressives, a.k.a. bipolars, a.k.a. people who have up and down emotional um, responses that are just very extreme. Uh, so if you can relate to that, I think a lot of people can relate to that. At least they believe that they can relate to that these days because doctors tell them that they should relate to that. Number five, then there are types entirely normal in every respect 
except in the effect alcohol is upon them. They are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. So when I read that, I obviously did not think that I was a part of that group. Um, there, for me, uh, I was not functioning at all. I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't have a real job. I didn't have a place to stay. I was homeless. I didn't have a car. I mean, I was a total mess. But there are a lot of people that come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and even Narcotics Anonymous who, you know, have jobs, who have relationships, who pay bills and who seem normal except for when they drink and use. So those are basically the five types of alcoholics or drug addicts, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to underline from there are up here all the way down to able, intelligent, and friendly people. Then it says, all these and many others have one symptom in common. One, they cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. And we're going to circle phenomenon of craving, okay? So this is this intense hunger, this bodily hunger, right? We're going to underline all these all the way to phenomenon of craving. It says, this phenomenon of craving, excuse me, this phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. And we're going to underline that too. So what they're saying is, is that this physical allergy is really what separates apart, us apart from normal people. So there's a lot of people out there talking about the roots and causes of alcoholism and drug addiction, right? Uh, the experiences that we had that made us drug addicts and alcoholics. But the doctor here is saying that it really does not matter what experiences you have. What makes us a drug addict or what makes us an alcoholic is that we have a physical allergy to drugs and alcohol. I know a lot of people who lived in the same household who had crazy parents with crazy experiences, uh, super abusive, and you know, one ended up an alcoholic and one didn't. You know, one ended up a drug addict and one didn't. So I'm not sure that this experiential uh, causes are what are leading us to drug and alcohol addiction, right? So, um, again, this phenomenon, as we suggest, it may be the manifestation of allergy which differentiates people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. So that separates us from the normal person. We're going to underline that too. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. So what that means is that this is never going away, okay? No matter what. So I can stay sober for 40 years, 50 years. I can stay sober till I'm 80 or 90 years old. And if I decide to pick up a drink or a drug at 80 or 90, I'm still going to trigger that physical allergy, no matter what, right? So that's that whole idea of people talking about us going to meetings and the disease doing push-ups outside. I mean, I'm not really sure what that analogy is, but whatever people say it. And basically what they're trying to tell you is that no matter when you decide to pick up, no matter how much time you've had in between now and your last drink or drug, the physical allergy will get triggered, the powerlessness will ensue, and you'll be on the road to destruction. So it says, the only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And we're gonna circle entire abstinence. So basically, this is really what separated Dr. Silkworth's opinion about drug and alcohol addiction from every other doctor that ever existed before, right? And even doctors today are still trying to teach drug addicts and alcoholics how to moderate. And of course, if you are a hard drinker and if you are a hard user, not an alcoholic or an addict, then yes, you can figure out a way to moderate. But if you are an alcoholic or an addict, if you have the physical allergy to drugs and alcohol, then you will never be able to moderate. So abstinence is the only way, right? It says, this immediately precipitates or leads us into a seething cauldron debate, right? Seething is like a boiling cauldron. is like a big witch's brew pot, right? It says, much has been written pro and con. We're going to underline that. But among physicians, the grant general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. And we're going to underline most chronic alcoholics are doomed. So a lot has been written, right? A lot has been written and the only thing that doctors and scientists can agree on is that most chronic alcoholics are doomed, which is kind of like what happens in society. Everyone can talk about the problems all day, but when it comes about, 
you know, uh, the solution. That's where everyone has different opinions, right? So that's what's going on here. So it says, what is the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. Now, basically what I usually do is I have the person I'm working with read this paragraph, right? And as they read this paragraph, I say to them, okay, cool. Once you read this paragraph, I want you to pick out the one sentence that uh, tells you the solution, okay? Because it starts with what is the solution? Perhaps I can best uh, answer this by relating one of my experiences, right? Obviously, um, it's here, so we're going to get into it anyway. So it says, about one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life, was only living, one might to say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. And we're going to underline and highlight that. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. Now that's the solution. And honestly, it's it's always that simple. Um, I had a sponsee that would call me up all the time and run his problems by me. And he always wanted like some specific direction about how to deal with his problems. And he got like really frustrated with me because... I would tell him to go work with somebody, you know, because I know that that's really the answer. Um, and I'll make that make sense for you, right? So if you take the time to go work with another human being, you're automatically doing what God's will is, right? And we'll talk about that later on in this book because God's will is basically to have your thinking run along the lines of how can I best serve thee? Now we already understand that thee is capitalized, thee meaning God. And then we also already talked about if I really understand who I am, I'm the light of God, my spirit will be joyful at all times, which means that I am the light of God. Every single person I take through the book is the light of God, which kind of inevitably means that everyone and everything is the light of God. So how can I best serve thee is how can I best serve everything around me, right? So the way that we perfect and enlarge our spiritual life is through doing that, okay? Now, the benefits of doing that is that we strengthen our relationship with this creator. We strengthen our relationship with this thing that loves us, wants the best for us, is taking care of us no matter what, which means that we are conscious of that in our life. And when we are conscious of being taken care of and conscious of feeling loved no matter what, right, then that means that every situation that's presented to us in each moment is perfect for us in that moment which means that we don't have to be in fear. Now, how many of our problems are based on fear? You know, how many decisions and reasons why we try to manage our life and control things are based on fear? So if we spend time working with another human being, we're already practicing something that removes that fear from our life. It also removes all of our defects of character, right? It removes our pride, it removes our anger, it removes our gluttony, it removes our envy, it removes our greed, it removes our lust, it removes our sloth, because if we are in service and we are in complete selflessness, then we are not in self and we are not trying to, you know, treat others not amazingly. The other thing about helping another person is that usually what's happening when we're in some sort of problem is that we are having some sort of emotional overreaction and working with another human being gives us space right it gives us space from the emotion gives us space from the reaction and it allows us time to you know get outside of self spend some time with another human being and then come back to the problem with some perspective you know, some objective perspective. And that's also a really helpful tool. So basically accepting the plan outlined in this book, which as you guys are going to see is all about working with other people and taking people through it, um, is really the answer. So it says, one year later, he called to see me and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck 
had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return from alcohol. So basically, the doctor is saying is that this guy grew, you know, and he changed. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis, and deciding his situation helpless, had hidden in a deserted barn determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which he frankly stated he thought the treatment was a waste of effort, unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. You're going to underline willpower to resist the impulse to drink. By the way, uh, I don't remember if I told you, but we're going to underline and highlight he accepted the plan outlined in this book. So back to willpower to resist the impulse to drink. We get that willpower. I have that willpower. Now it's because I'm tapped into God's will, but I have that willpower. Obviously, in my job, um, I'm surrounded by drugs and alcohol all the time, and I have no problem saying no today. It's easy. Um, the obsession has been lifted, and that's just how it is. So it happens. It says his alcoholic problem was so complex and his depression was so great that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology. We're going to underline and highlight moral psychology. Again, we talked about what that was before and why we need it. And we doubted if even that would have any effect. It says, however, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then. He is a fine specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I love that. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through. And though perhaps he came to scoff or mock or not take this seriously, he may remain to pray. So, you know, the doctor is saying he hopes that you find a relationship with your own higher power, whatever that is. William Duncan Silkworth, right? Okay, Bill's story. The first thing that we do is you write Bill's birthday up here. Bill W. birthday, 12-11-1934. I'm American, though, so that's December 11th, 1934. I know now living in another country that people write things differently. So, basically, when I work with people, this is their first sort of take-home writing assignment that they do. And the reason is this. So basically, Bill's story and every other story in the book is representative of a speaker at an AA meeting, right? And what do they tell you to do when you go to AA meetings? They told you to, you know, look for the similarities, right? So basically, that's what we do with Bill's story. But again, Bill's story was also written uh, a long time ago, so it's got English in it that a lot of us don't understand, so it's really hard to find the similarities if you can't understand uh, what you're reading. So what this assignment is, is a two-parter. What I had people do, what my sponsor had me do, was he had me read Bill's story. He had me underline any word that I uh, did not understand, and he had me define that word in a separate notebook piece of paper, right? And then he also had me highlight um, any sentence in the book that uh, I could relate to, right? And then I would copy that sentence down into the notebook, and underneath that sentence, I'd write as many things that I could think of from my personal life that allowed me to relate to it. So, I'm not going to go into that much detail in reading Bill's story. I'm going to give you some examples because when I, like I said, when I did this process, I was 10 years sober. So, writing about my drinking and using issues was not super relevant to my life at that time. But my sponsor really wanted me to also write about um, the behavior, right, and try to relate to this based on behavior and I'll talk about that as we go through. So, you guys ready? Let's do Bill's story. Chapter 1, Bill's story. I suggest you that you do that assignment though because basically it's going to be the best first step assignment that you can ever possibly do. It's super thorough and will help you identify a lot of things whether 
you're brand new or you have a lot of time in sobriety, it'll be really helpful. So it says, War fever ran high in the New England town to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. And we were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. Sublime meaning most excellent. I was part of life at last, and in the midst of that excitement, I discovered liquor. So ask yourself, what did that feel like? When did you finally feel like you were part of life at last? Which means that there was a time before that where you didn't feel a part of. So for me, it was like... <laughs> Every moment that I had pre-14 was feeling completely uncomfortable and uh, not a part of anything. And then finally, meeting kids uh, the summer before my first year of high school and uh, feeling a part of something, you know, and then like smoking weed with them and feeling even more a part of something and starting a band and feeling like I finally belong somewhere, Right. It says, I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. So, you know, I had a uncle that was an alcoholic that my parents used to talk about. Um, or, you know, I had friends that, you know, uh, had a son that was a drug addict that my parents and my parents' friends used to talk about. So, I mean, I definitely had warnings in my life around people drinking and using. In time, we sailed for over there. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. So, have you ever turned to alcohol or drugs when you were lonely? We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My intention was caught by a dog roll on an old tombstone. Now, what's a dog roll? So, dog roll is like a poorly written or often humorous verse, right? And here it is. It says, Here lieth the Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is never forgot whether he died by musket or the pot, right? So whether he dies by a gun or by a pot of beer. So what is small beer? Small beer is a beer that's not fully processed, right? So basically you're talking about a soldier that, you know, um, A, didn't probably have a lot of money and also couldn't wait. So he drank the shit stuff because he was that much of an alcoholic, right? And it wound up killing him. It says ominous warning. Ominous is foretelling. It means it's, you know, uh, a mark of the future, which I fail to heed. And heed means pay attention to. 22 and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader. For had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation. So who of us have ever fancied ourselves as leaders? My talent for leadership. I imagined would place me at the head of vast enterprises which would manage excuse me which I would manage with the utmost assurance so who of us have had grandiose ideas of ourselves managing the universe and controlling everybody and you know or controlling our families or the people around us because we know best I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for a surety company the drive for success was on I proved to the world I was important so, what have you done to prove to the world that you are important? And why did you feel unimportant? These are the questions that you want to ask yourself. How have you tried to prove the world that you are important? It says, my work took me about Wall Street, and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? I study economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. I can relate to this. I was in Israel going to high school for my 11th grade, and it was my SAT day. It was the night before, and me and my friends all decided to get really drunk in the dorm room. And I remember falling asleep during the math portion of the SAT uh, test because I was you know, so hungover from the night before. It says... Uh, Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. So, has our drinking and using ever disturbed our relationships, or the people we were in a relationship with? How? When? We had lost, excuse me, we had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk, that the most majestic constructions of philosophy, excuse me, yeah, <laughs> the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. 
Majestic is magnificent. Constructions of philosophic thought. Okay, so cool. Um, I was into music. I was into poetry when I was younger. And I definitely thought that when I smoked weed or when I took mushrooms that it brought me closer to the universe and that the way that my mind worked uh, in those moments was so much deeper than anything that anyone could ever experience sober. That was my line of thinking. So I could definitely relate to that. Scenery change. Woo! By the time I completed the course, I knew the law, that law was not for me. So basically, this is talking about someone who put some work into something but didn't follow through and left it behind. Look around you and think about how many unfinished projects you've got going on in your life and see if you can relate to that. The inviting maelstrom. Maelstrom is a resistless agent of destruction to all in its path, which is just like such an amazing way to describe Wall Street. So the inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy or combination of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that would one day turn its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. So that's interesting because basically he's saying it's a combination of two things that destroyed him later on in life. One was the drink, which is obvious, but the other is the thinking, you know? So a lot of us think that once we get sober and we just take away the drugs and the alcohol, all is fine. But our thinking is really messed up too. And our thinking is just as destructive, if not more, than our drinking and using. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what we're left with when we take away the drink and the drug. So it says, living modestly, my wife and I saved $1,000. It went to certain securities. Then cheap and rather unpopular, I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements. But my wife and I decided to go anyway. I developed a theory that many people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. So Bill was really innovative, right? Like he came up with a niche job that basically everyone told him he was a crazy person for, you know, even thinking of. And his wife, Lois, was awesome. I mean, she was just amazing. She was just there with him every step of the way. And a lot of like her reasoning for wanting to be on the road with Bill and why she enjoyed it so much was that when they were on the road together, he drank less and he was much easier to be around. So a lot of that was her motivation. That was her way of trying to manage Bill's drinking. So she was more than happy to give up everything and go on the road. It says, we gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle. How romantic. The sidecar stuffed with 10 blankets and a change of clothes and three huge volumes of financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. So everyone thought he was crazy. Everyone advised against it, but he did it anyway, which is ballsy and pretty cool. Perhaps they were right. I had had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on our part for many a day. We covered the whole East, Eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured or obtained me a position there and the usage of a large expense account. So basically, Bill got some money. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. So, who can relate to that? Who struck gold with some sort of thinking of theirs or some sort of plan of theirs and you know people finally acknowledged you for the man or woman that you thought that you were or should be acknowledged as i had arrived who felt like that and how and when my judge excuse me my judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions the great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling drink was taking an important exhilarating part of my life so are you writing about when alcohol and drugs took an exhilarating part of your life. When was it fun? There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. So where were you the big shot in your life? Where did you exaggerate stuff or things about yourself to make yourself look better to your peers? Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair weather friends. So let's check out our friends. Who of them were fair weather? How many of them were there for you when you hit bottom? 
you know, or did they bail on you, you know? My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row and I became a lone wolf. Remonstrances are like protests. So basically what he's saying is that his drinking and using got so bad that people just gave up on him. No one really tried to stop him anymore. They're like, you know what, he's just the drunk. So ask yourself, when did that happen in your life? Was there a time where people gave up on you? Was there family members or spouses that gave up on you? Were there jobs that gave up on you? And write about that. It says there were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. Sumptuous is luxurious. There had been no real infidelity. This is probably a lie. For loyal to me, loyalty to my wife helped at times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. The reason why it says this probably a lie is because if Bill had such an issue with sort of womanizing and lust in sobriety, it's very challenging for me to believe that there was no infidelity happening uh, while he was drinking and using. Um, yeah, and plus that was definitely not my experience at all. Uh, whatever I did drinking and using, I definitely did sober and vice versa. In 1929, I contracted Gulf fever. We went at once to the country, my wife to applaud while I started out to overtake Walter Hagen. Now, Walter Hagen was a major figure in golf in the first half of the uh, 20th century. He was born uh, December of 1892 and he died October 1969. Um, Walter Hagen is... I guess equivalent of like let's say Tiger Woods right today so just the arrogance behind Bill's <laughs> idea of starting to play golf and then being able to overtake Walter Hagen is just uh, an example of Bill's pride right who can relate to that who's ever thought of themselves as some you know uh, ridiculous person in terms of their pride right overinflated ego Liquor caught up with me much faster than I came up behind Walter, so he was humbled by his liquor. I began to be jittery in the morning. Golf permitted drinking every day and every night. It was fun to crum around the exclusive course which had inspired such awe in me as a lad. So, crum means to bounce around, but it's funny language to use. Bill was a wordsmith, and it also means to sink more than one ball with one shot. So there's even some arrogance in using that word, right? Now, also look in your life and question, have you ever taken a job or got yourself involved in an opportunity that allowed you to drink or use more, you know? How did your drinking and using sculpt your life decisions? That's a good question to always ask yourself. Um, some of us became bartenders, some of us, you know, got into the entertainment industry, um, some of us did, you know, uh, wine tasting, sommelier, all kinds of different things to basically put ourselves in a position where we, you know, could drink or use more. Or like me, I became a drug dealer because there was drugs around. It made more sense to me, right? So, it said, uh... I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. The local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of his till with amused skepticism. So even the banker was looking at him like, bro, who's this dude? It says, abruptly in October 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days, excuse me, after one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock, five hours after the market closed. The ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ negative 32. It had been 52 that morning, so it was a big drop. I was finished, and so were my friends. The papers reported men jumping to death from the uh, towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. My friends had dropped several millions since 10 o'clock, so what? Tomorrow was another day. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. So when has, you know, some circumstance in your life basically hit the fan and you were just like, oh shit, right? And you're watching people around you react in ways and you're looking at them like, what are these people doing? I'm going to be okay. Next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left and thought I had better go to Canada. So Bill's still hustling, right? So when in your life have you been a hustler? 
By the following spring, we were living in our accustomed lifestyle. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba, no Saint Helena for me. So basically Napoleon was exiled to Elba, he escaped. Saint Helena was where he was finally imprisoned and died. So Bill is even saying like, you know, nothing's gonna hold me back, I'm still gonna make it. So he still had some fight in him, right? So again, take a look at your drinking and using. When did you still think that you had game? And how did that get in the way of you quitting, right? Or look at your defects of character in sobriety. Where do you think that they still serve you, you know? And is that the reason why you still hold on to them and still basically act out on them without remorse? It says, but drinking caught up with me again and my generous friend had to let me go. This time we stayed broke. We went to live with my wife's parents. I found a job and lost it as a result uh, of a brawl with a taxi driver. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work in a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. I became an unwelcome hanger-on at brokerage firms, uh, at brokerage places. So take a look at your life. Um, take a look at how you depended on people or are currently depending on people. You're not self-supporting through your own contributions where you're just basically an unwelcome hanger on. Take a look at that. Um, okay, cool. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Let's look at that. When did drugs and alcohol stop being something that we wanted to do, but just started becoming something that we couldn't help but doing? Or if you're sober, and have been sober a while, let's look at some behavior, you know, maybe it's gambling, maybe it's food, maybe it's sex, and look at where those things at one time gave you pleasure, but are no longer giving you the same kind of pleasure, but you continue to do them, and you continue to feel the remorse about them, right? It says, bathtub gin, two bottles a day, and often three got to be routine. Bathtub gin was basically industrial strength alcohol tossed in a bathtub, and they would sometimes throw in some juniper leaves to give it some flavor. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. So think about those times in your life where you came up on a little bit of money. You know, for me it was basically my birthday or something, you know, uh, where the family would give me, you know, a hundred bucks or something. Uh, and I would basically collect my birthday money to try to buy some more drugs so that I could sell it and cut it and blah 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 and do all that nonsense stuff, right? This went on endlessly and I began to waken very early in the morning shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin followed by half a dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hopes. So, look at the times where you thought that you can control the situation, you know, in and out of sobriety. So, out of sobriety with behavior, I mean, in so <laughs> let me try that again. When you're in sobriety, look at how you could control, try to control situations uh, in terms of your behavior. When you're out of sobriety, look at tr how you try to control things in terms of your drinking and using, right? Um, and then look at how those times that you managed to control it a little bit, how that not only renewed the people's hope around you, but even your own hope. And basically, how are you using that to justify you being able to control your drinking and using, or you having power over certain behaviors that you're trying to let go of? Cool. Gradually, things got worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point of 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious, which means very great bender, and that chance vanished. So, look in your life and try to find that time where you had an opportunity that you wanted to show up for and you got high and you basically messed it all up. Or look at that time in your life in sobriety where you had an opportunity uh, or a relationship opportunity or a business opportunity or whatever and you acted out in rage or you were gambling or you were at home 
eating too much or you were out philandering with another man or woman and you just destroyed everything, you know? Um, we're really good at basically building ourselves up and then pulling it all down upon our head in and out of sobriety. I woke up, this had to be stopped. I saw I could not take as much as one drink. I was through forever, but then I had written lots of sweet promises. Excuse me, before then I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business and so I did. So he really felt serious in this moment, right? But shortly afterward I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way and I hadn't taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near just being that. So, how many times have you, you know, thought about going to the meeting and then all of a sudden you're turning the steering wheel and getting off the freeway where the dealer is? Or you're heading home from work and all of a sudden you're pulling over to a parking lot where there's a prostitute. You know, these things where you have no intention of doing, right? You really want to be the good person. You really want to be the moral person. You really want to be the drug-free or the alcohol-free person. But something takes over your body and you literally find yourself doing something that you later feel despicable. But that you're completely powerless over in that moment. Think about that. Write about that. Renewing my resolve. I tried again. Some time passed and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. So, again, when have we become arrogant about managing our defects? Or when have we become arrogant about managing our drugs and alcohol? I could laugh at the gym mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to a telephone. In no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose in my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. Because basically, F it, right? But I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. So the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. So that applies to obviously drug and alcohol use, but it also applies to behavior. You know, if you cheat on your relationship, did you feel remorse and horror the next morning? If you lost your family's, you know, your kid's tuition fund because you were out there gambling, the remorse and horror and hopelessness of the next morning. So write about that. So if you got some time sober, um, I'm sure that you didn't get sober and get perfect. I know that I didn't. Definitely take the time to write about, you know, those defects of character in sobriety where, you know, you've acted out and you've had this hopeless feeling, right? And if you're brand new, this should be easy for you to look at those times where, you know, you wanted to stop but couldn't, you know? The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street lest, collapse, lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Jim would fix that, and so two bottles and oblivion. So, have you ever had thoughts of suicide? Has it ever felt so overwhelming that you wanted to die? Now, if you're still on the path of drinking and using, maybe you can drink and use, and you know that seems like a viable solution. But um, if you're in a situation where you've been sober a while and you know that drinking and using is not the way, then sometimes suicide becomes that thing. So write about those times where, you know, you considered just ending it all, right? The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endured this agony for two more years. So he was sitting in this bottom for two years, right? Now, this is the amazing thing and this is kind of how I understand a God working in my life, right? So I was sitting in the same bottom basically for three years of my life, right? The cars were gone, the houses were gone, I was, you know, doing drugs, I'd been in jail every year for the last three years of my using, 
Um, there's always unmanageability. My friends just were messes too. It was just a big shit show, basically, right? So, and the reason why I'm tying the whole God thing into this is that the bottom didn't really get any darker than any other day. Every day was its own darkness. It was its own thing. So really the question is, is that why was it that this one day the thought came into my mind that basically illuminated the idea that maybe drugs and alcohol were a problem for me? I mean, that really came out of nowhere. Why did I not consider that in the beginning of the first year? Why did it take three years, you know? So that to me means that like it has nothing to do with anything that's actually happening. That's the depth of my bottom is not that. It was really just like an intuitive voice that gave me the clarity to take a look around and be like, oh, maybe this is the issue, right? So that to me is a power greater than my, me waking me up, you know? That's a spiritual awakening right there. Um, it did not come from me because I was really happy leaving my bottom as we read in you know, the doctor's opinion, our alcoholic life became our only normal one. It was super normal for me to be living the way that I was. So it says, uh, Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. So when have you stolen from your loved ones? Right about that. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window. Or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. So who's wanted to kill themselves, but understood and knew that they were too weak to do it and hated themselves for that. I can relate to that. There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. There was no flights for me. I couldn't afford any of that. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish. I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Sash is the window frame, by the way. It's not like something that he wore around his waist or around his head or was a pirate. Okay, cool, cool, sorry. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor, lest I suddenly leap. The doctor came with a heavy sedative. We're going to underline sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. So we're going to underline gin and sedative. The importance of that is that Bill is talking about drugs in his story, okay? The importance of Bill talking about drugs in the story is A, he's one of the founding members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and B, if Bill is talking about drugs in his story, uh, and the stories are basically examples, speakers at a meeting, then any person who has experience with drugs in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous should be able to share openly about it because um, this encompasses drug and alcohol addiction, right? Because that's what he's talking about in this moment. So if you're out there trying to shame somebody for sharing about drugs in the meeting, um, it's right here in black and white. So it says, this combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity, so did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. Who can relate to that? My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. And this was the Charles B. Town Hospital. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, so belladonna was basically a sedative and antispasmodic, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor, this is Dr. Silkworth that he's talking about, who explained that, through, that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily and mentally. It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it has often remained strong in other respects. Can anyone relate to that? Does anyone have experience where when applying their will in their life, amazing things happen, but when trying to apply their will to their drinking and using, it's just a mess. My incredible behavior in the face of desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely, this was the answer of self-knowledge. But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. So, who in here has relapsed before? Who in here went to treatment and spent 
30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, or even a year in a sober living and then got out and still relapsed, but thought that they knew something and thought that knowing something and practicing behaviors and being introduced to meetings and even working steps um, with sponsors was the answer. But when you really look back on your life, how much did you dedicate your life to working with others? See, again, we're going back to the program, right? If you're not working all three sides of the triangle, you're not working the program, period. The program only works if you work it. So that's what you have to think about, you know, and even those people that will tell you they've worked all the steps and they, you know, had a sponsor and they did go to meetings and they did all this stuff, you know, and they still went out after 10 years sober, you know, ask them. How many people were you working with? Were you dedicating your life to working with as many people as you possibly could? And I promise you that they can't say yes. Although they may talk about service, and they talk about service commitments and service commitments and meetings and you know service commitments on a bigger level with GSR and blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to working with another human being, that's always what's lacking, right? So... Uh, Self-knowledge will not keep you sober, but working with other alcoholics will. So it says, The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish. The curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delir delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain. So basically, it's over for Bill. Wet brain is when you have irreversible uh, alcohol damage to the brain, basically. Delirium tremens are, uh, you know, the shakes mixed, mixed with hallucinations. So it's not pretty, basically. It says she would soon have to give me over to the undertaker of the asylum. So basically, they were left with two choices. Either you're going to die or you're going to have to be committed. They did not need to tell me I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, and my capacity to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. So who felt like that? Who thought that, you know, they were so smart or they had it all together or they could just think their way. They were so crafty and clever that how could this possibly happen to them, right? And who thinks that even in sobriety? Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots. Sots are just drunks who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness, after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. So who felt like it was too late, right? The damage was done, it was too deep, and they could never make up for it. It says no words can tell of the loneliness and despair. I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Morass is like uh, quicksand, right? Oh, and then it says, quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. So think about that time when you finally realized that alcohol and drugs were your master, or gambling was your master, or your pursuit of material stuff was your master, or the pursuit of a relationship or sex was your master or whatever, right? Sloth was your master. Write about that stuff, okay? Write about the loneliness and despair that you felt, you know? Sometimes when we are sober a long time and we are acting out on defects of character, it's a really lonely place to be because, you know, maybe we enjoy a certain reputation in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. People look at us a certain way and if people knew the kind of people that we were outside of meetings, then they would judge us, you know? And then we stop telling our sponsor things, and then we stop going to meetings, and then we stop basically doing anything because we feel completely hopeless, right? That was definitely my experience between the years of, you know, four years of sobriety and probably eight, eight or nine years of sobriety. You know, and that was a really lonely place for me to be in. And it wasn't until that I was introduced to this process that I actually felt some real hope sober, right? So it's trebling. I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious, which means sly or treacherous, 
and sanity of that first drink. So what that means is that a the insanity creeps up on us. It doesn't come at us right away or directly. So for me, my brain won't tell me like I want to drink and use. What it'll tell me is that you know, why did that guy look at me funny at the AA meeting? You know, does he not like me? Do other people at the AA meeting not like me? Maybe I can't go to that meeting anymore, but there's only like three meetings in the island. And like, you know what I mean? My brain will run with that stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm not going to meetings. And all of a sudden, I'm not working with anybody. And all of a sudden, I'm not doing anything that has anything to do with any kind of program, right? And then I'm alone and I'm out on this island and then when I'm feeling really low, when I've created a manageability in my life, when I feel like I've got no one that I can call and turn to, the idea of why don't you just have a drink? Or they look like they look like they're having fun. Why don't you just go get high with them? You know, that's how it creeps up. So it's sly, right? It's treacherous. It says on an armistice day, which is just Veterans Day in America, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to shut up, uh, that I would have to be shut up somewhere, or would stumble along uh, to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, it was the beginning of my last debauch, or uh, his last run, basically. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to be called the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. So the fourth dimension of existence. The fourth dimension is when space meets time, right? So why would that be happiness, peace, and usefulness? So basically what he's being catapulted in is the now, the absolute present moment. Now look around you right now. What's happening right now in this moment around you? Right now in this very moment, are there bills to pay? Is there a relationship? Is, re uh, is there a relationship to appease? Is there, you know, family to appease? Are there bombs dropping down on your house right now? Are there aliens going around and killing people? Or are you just in a room or in a cafe or wherever? quietly listening to this video with everything being cool. So basically what Bill's saying is that the present moment is always cool. You know, it's really the fear and the thinking of the future or the regret and shame of the past that disturbs our moment. But the moment itself is usually just fine. You know, and that is the fourth dimension. That is where, you know, true happiness and peace and usefulness exists. Now, one way to bring us to the moment is to be useful. So again, I know I'm like a broken record, but if you're working with people, you are being launched into the present moment because you are focusing on what's in front of you, which is that other alcoholic or addict that you're working with. You know, the more you practice doing that, the more practice you are being able to put yourself in the present and looking around at what's in front of you and being able to sit in appreciation and gratitude rather than fear. So it says, near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through the night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I wouldn't need it before daylight. So, of course, if you've ever hidden drugs or alcohol around your house, please write about that if you can relate to that. And I think I'm going to stop there because we're about to meet Mr. Ebby Thatcher, and I think it's a good place to, to give it a rest. But I hope you enjoyed the session. Again, remind you, comments. Please let me know if you're taking other people through this process and what experience you're having with it. I'd love to hear from you. And, uh, yeah, thanks again for watching. See ya.